Hey you guys, welcome back to Flickers of Fear, my movie review series. So, 2022's Skinnamarink. This was easily one of my top five most anticipated movies to see this year. Um, if you're curious, actually the other four are Knock at the Cabin, uh, which is based on a Paul Tremblay novel that I really liked, uh, Infinity Pool, the Brandon Cronenberg one, um, Renfield, and The Voyage of the Demeter. So those are the other four. But Skin and Marink was actually the first one that I finally got to lay my eyeballs on because Shudder, if you have it, just added Skin and Marink uh, to their streaming service, I think on February 2nd or something like that. I guess it did kind of like a brief theatrical run. I don't know if it played around here or not because we don't really get to the theater that much anymore. Um, but apparently like it did really well, like it made over a million dollars, like even though the budget was only $15,000, so it was financially very successful. But yeah, if you have Shudder, uh, you can, at least in the United States, you can absolutely watch it uh, on there as of February 2nd. But all I knew about this one really was that the movie had gotten massive amounts of buzz online, like especially on TikTok. I remember like seeing a lot of people like talking about it on there. What ended up happening was that the movie debuted at the Fantasia Film Festival, and then because of some technical fuck up, it actually got leaked online. So a lot of people actually got to see it before it actually came out. Now, pretty much the only things I was aware of was that there was a big buzz about it, um, that the audience reaction to the movie was very, very polarized, which is usually, like, intriguing for me because I really like movies that people either love them or hate them. Like, because to me, that seems like it's going to be more interesting because if everyone's just kind of like, eh, it was all right, you know what I mean? That it's probably not all that exciting. But if, if people are having really extreme reactions to it, then it's obviously probably worth watching. Um, but I did manage to avoid any kind of spoilers or reviews or anything like that prior to getting to watch it for myself. So I could come into it with as few preconceptions about it as possible. I didn't even watch the trailer or anything like that, which is the way that I kind of prefer to go about things. Um, and as usual, I'm immensely, immensely glad that I didn't really know that much about this one going in because I found it a lot more, I guess, like a lot more unsettling experience when I didn't really know what to expect from it. Now, I'm going to give a big, huge, gigantic, neon flashing uh, caveat, though. I really, really hesitate to recommend this movie to anybody whose very, very specific horror taste I don't know. Because Skin of Marink is experimental as fuck. And I feel like most people who approach it expecting like a traditional narrative structure or you know traditional storytelling beats or something like that will absolutely be confused angry and or bored to death uh, with this movie because really unless you allow yourself to just completely vibe with this movie's infinitesimally small like <laughs> narrow band of purpose i guess you want to call it that it will seem as though maybe to you that nothing at all is happening for like a very large segment of the movie's, you know, hour and 40 minute runtime. So like a slow burn is one thing, but this is another situation entirely. So I'm not saying, so I'm just warning people ahead of time, like know what you're getting into. I'm really serious about that. Like Skin of Marink basically looked at, you know, uh, Mark Danieleski's House of Leaves, the novel, um, you know, Antrim, the deadliest movie ever made, if you've seen that, uh, Begotten, if you've seen that, uh, Michael Snow's Wavelength, if anybody's seen that one, which is just like several hours of just a camera going up to a window, um, David Lynch's Inland Empire, particularly the part of it that's uh, rabbits, like the short, like the weird little uh, sitcom that's in there with the rabbit head people. This movie kind of looked at all those movies and was like, oh, you think you're inscrutable? You think you've actually captured like an actual human nightmare on film? Hold my fucking beer because I'm about to tell you. Because <laughs> I'm about to show you what inscrutability and like capturing an actual nightmare actually looks like, motherfuckers. So that's kind of where this movie is at. So what I'm saying is that if you like any of the movies that I just mentioned, and also especially if you're really into kind of ARGs or like analog type of horror, you know, it's, you know, where something is like old tech, if you're into that kind of stuff, then Skin of Marink should be right up your alley. Um, you do have to be very patient with it and open to what it's trying to do because it's really trying to replicate a very, very particular feeling, a very particular experience that apparently a lot of people have had. So go into it like knowing that that's what it's doing. 
Now, for everybody else, uh, if you just like traditional horror, if you just like, you know, just a regular narrative style, I would advise staying far, far away because you will probably really, really hate this. I really dug it, but I understand uh, why you might not. You know what I mean? It's just, it's subjective, again. Um, I would also recommend, even though I would usually recommend, because, like I said, this is a, a very independent filmmaker, so I would usually uh, advocate, hey, like, go to the theater and support it. I really think, though, that for maximum effectiveness of this movie, I think it's probably better not to see it in a theater because I think there'd be too many people or too many distractions. I think the best way to watch this movie, actually, is just completely alone in your house in the middle of the night. Like, and your house should be, like, completely pitch black, like, as dark as you can make it. Just sit up in the middle of the night and watch this. No other distractions, no other people around, no nothing. And then after you watch it, you should make your way back to your bedroom without turning any lights on. You know, you can use a flashlight or something like that if you want. And then when you get in your room, just lay there in your bed in the dark with your eyes open and just keep staring out at like the shadowed corners of the room and just think about the movie you just watched. I think, I think if you do that, it's like a whole, it's a whole experience. It's a whole vibe. And I think that that would probably be like the most effective way to scare yourself shitless like with this movie. Okay, so to get a feel of what you're in for, matter of fact, and to uh, gauge whether this movie would be something that you would enjoy, go to a YouTube channel, which is actually made by the director of Skin and Marink. This is his first feature length film, but he made short films before this. And his name is Kyle Edward Ball. And he has a channel called Bite Sized Nightmares. And he basically produces short films trying to replicate people's nightmares that they've described to him. Um, there are several on there that are only a few minutes long, like four or five minutes, something like that. But there's also one called Heck, which is about 28, 29 minutes long. And um, that was like the proof of concept, kind of like preparation short for Skinamarink. So the idea for Skinamarink uh, came out of this YouTube project. What Kyle Ball was trying to do was that he started to notice like when people were sending him like descriptions of their childhood nightmares or stuff that had um, stuck with them like over the years, he started to notice that many people's um, nightmares, particularly from their childhood, had very similar themes or very similar imagery in it. So it seemed like he was kind of curious to see if he could tap into this sort of like primal, half-remembered like childhood dream state that maybe we all collectively share. So I think he actually really um, kind of nailed it uh, with Skin of uh, which came across to me as just very, very familiar like it's it was just kind of mesmerizing it was just kind of like this spooky it just gives you this whole sensation and I think and it's not just me because I kind of feel like a lot of other people um it also reminded them too of like creepy nightmares they had had as children well hell not even as children because when I was watching this movie I was like holy shit I still have nightmares like this now you know what I mean but I think like people will remember um when they watch it feeling like this, particularly as a child, you know what I mean? And I think it's like an experience and a feeling that a lot of people can relate to, which I think is why a lot of people are talking about it. So Skin of Marink is like one of the nightmare shorts that's on that channel, but it's like more lo-fi and extended out to like an hour and 40 minutes. Also the house he shot Skin of Marink in, which is actually his childhood home, uh, which, you know, we'll get into that a little bit in a minute, but that house, that same house, like also appears in all the other shorts that I've watched on that channel. I watch them all but like the ones that I watched he uses the same house you know what I mean so the plot of this movie if you want to call it that I mean I really don't but I don't really know how else to put it it concerns two children uh six-year-old Kaylee and four-year-old Kevin uh you know obviously their brother and sister the year is 1995 that's when this is set now the kids are apparently in the house with their parents or at least their dad but keep in mind that throughout pretty much the entire running time, you don't really see anyone in the movie at all. Like, you kind of do, but you never see anybody, like, full on, or you never, like, see anybody's face full on or anything like that. And it's not just because the whole movie is very, very dark, and it's the way it's shot is, like, super, super grainy. Most of the time, the kids, who are, like, the main characters, if you want to say that, um, they're kind of off screen, like you're generally seeing things from their perspective. So everything is from like a child's, uh, you know, viewpoint. So everything's kind of like down closer to the floor. 
Um, you see their legs and feet sometimes. You know, you see, you know, the side of someone's face. You see, like, the back of their head. Something like that. So the mother and father are seen even less. Um, and they're usually seen from the back, particularly the mom. Um, and that is something, I think I've brought this up before, but that's something that's always weirded me out in horror movies, just seeing the back of someone's head. For some reason, that's, like, really creepy. So I think that one of the reasons that I liked this movie so much is that it seemed almost particularly, I mean, very tailored to my own very weird and very idiosyncratic you know, creep buttons, I guess, if you want to call them that. Like, I'm very, very creeped out by, like, just going into a room and, like, just seeing someone sitting there with, like, the back of their head and they don't turn around or anything. Like, that creeps me out. Um, seeing someone's face, like, with some of their features removed, uh, that happens in this as well. So this seemed, like, very, very calculated to kind of push those particular buttons, like, this, that creep me out, you know what I mean? So it's very, very good at doing that. So it really did a number on me in that regard, because there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on in this. So there are some hints like near the beginning of the movie that the boy, Kevin, has had some kind of accident and has maybe fallen down the stairs, like perhaps while he was sleepwalking. But his dad tells someone on the phone, maybe the mom, we're not entirely sure who he's talking to. But he says, oh, the kid's pretty much fine. Like, you know, he went to the hospital, but he didn't even need stitches. But like his head is messed up or something like that. Now, soon after this event, the children apparently wake up in their dark ass house in the middle of the night, I'm assuming. And they discover that not only have their parents evidently disappeared from the house entirely, but also the children themselves are unable to leave the house because all the doors and windows are vanishing. Um, like there's a scene where Kevin pulls up the blinds, like, you know, Venetian blinds, and there's just like a solid wall behind them. Like there's kind of the thing where they go down the hall and there's like a door and then it just like disappears and then it's just a blank wall. So the kids are trapped in this house in the middle of the night, their parents are gone, and now they can't get out. So unsure of what to do, they're not, th that's what I think is like really great about this because the kids don't panic. I mean, they're four and six. Like they seem to know that something is wrong and it's like kind of scary, but they don't really seem to grasp how weird or how monumental the situation is or how much danger they might potentially be in. They seem like very unsettled, like, oh, you know, that's kind of weird. But much like a, an actual kid would, they can't really wrap their heads, you know, because they're children. So they can't really wrap their heads around, you know, if an adult, like if that happened to an adult, you would be freaking the fuck out because you would know how fucking strange that was. But because kids are, I guess in some ways, they, they don't really understand the gravity of the situation. And they also don't, you know, like I said, they can't really wrap their head around how bizarre it is because kids are just more open to, you know, weird experiences because they don't have enough experience of the world to, like, know how how not right that is. So they're unsettled, but they're not terrified, you know what I mean? So they're just trying to kind of, like, deal with things in the best way that a kid would deal with them. So they don't really know what to do. They kind of creep downstairs to the living room and turn on the TV because that's, you know, I guess that's kind of soothing. And they put like some cartoons on. So most of the movie has this really strange immersive atmosphere that I kind of feel like many of us might, might remember, like from being a child and being up way past our bedtimes. Like the house is like really quiet except for this just kind of distant music and voices from like these old like weird cartoons. Um, the only light in the house is this blue flicker from like the old CRT screen. And, you know, they build like a little kind of pillow fort. They have like a little couch that they kind of push inside because it makes them feel like safer. Like they're kind of like walling themselves off. They bring down their stuffed animals and their Legos and everything like that. So like I said, they're, they're kind of like making a little protective bubble. They don't really know what else to do because they're just like children. So a lot of the movie's runtime is concerned with just these types of experiences. So there's just these lingering shots of just like darkened hallways and doorways where the very grainy film stock just kind of starts making your imagination play tricks on you. Like it's really encouraging you to kind of like pick shapes out of the darkness, you know what I mean? Because it's very grainy and you're just like, is that a person? Is that like a shadow? Like you can't really tell. 
Um, and there's also these kind of like mysterious and kind of unexplained like thumps and creaks and stuff like that, like coming from upstairs. You don't exactly know, you know, what's in the house, who's in the house, what's going on. Uh, the kids also talk only in whispers. And uh, some of the whispers are actually subtitled. Now I had the closed captioning on because I'm deaf as shit. The thing about it is I would advise it because sometimes you can't really tell because some of the voices and stuff like that are really quiet or they're really distorted. So sometimes you can't really tell what they're saying because not everything is subtitled like in the movie itself, like sometimes. So I did have the subtitles on. It kind of ruins the illusion a little bit, but I kind of like that I had it on because I don't think I would have caught some of the dialogue and some of the dialogue I think is sort of important like to sort of suss out what exactly is going on in this. I have to say too like the sound design in general here is also goes a long way toward making this movie like really disquieting like to watch because like I said there's just kind of whispers and these distant distorted voices that are interspersed with just occasional kind of ominous tones, like these just weird sinister sounding tones in the background. And then there's also like these kind of very sudden jarring shrieks, which kind of like accompany this pretty upsetting like flashes of imagery. So there's kind of like jump scares kind of um, going through there with this like a really loud noise and then something like cuts away. So there's that kind of stuff going on there too. So as the movie goes on, like ever more bizarre things start to take place in the house. Like for example, like you kind of get sort of like poltergeist activity kind of like the a chair like they hear a thump and then all of a sudden this chair which had been like sitting in the kitchen is now like on the ceiling which that freaked me the fuck out like sh shit like that like freaks me the fuck out because it's like not overt like it's not overtly horror like blah it's a demon or anything like that but it's just like little shit like that where something is just wrong like everything else is normal but then all of a sudden the chair is like oh now the chair is on the ceiling now like that to me that sort of like um this that incongruity is like really really creepy to me so a lot of the stuff in this movie like really like i said really did a number on me because this is like it seemed specifically tailored to like my own weird things that creep me out you know what i mean so yeah so you got like a chair going up on the ceiling like toys and like other objects kind of disappear and then like they'll re reappear in like very uncanny like configurations like now they're all stuck to the wall or something like that um, the cartoons on the TV, like, kind of start pausing and, like, looping over and over. And then you start hearing this very sinister, distorted voice. And it starts trying to lure the children to other parts of the house, like, come upstairs or come down to the basement. And eventually gets to a point where it's kind of encouraging them to do harm to themselves. I mean, one scene in particular that really... <laughs> kind of freaked me out and I think a lot of people because I watched a couple other reviews of this and a lot of people brought this scene up um because it's pretty skin crawling but it's when Kaylee the little girl she goes into her parents room I'm presuming and she sees her father sitting on the edge of the bed like pretty much all we see of him is his legs like clad in pajama pants and he's just like and his hands which are kind of like gripping the edge of the bed like that but like I said it's dark so you can't really see anyone's face so you can't really see exactly what's going on so the implication is, they don't say this outright, but the way the movie goes, you're kind of led to assume that this maybe isn't actually the child's father, but is perhaps this, whatever this thing is that's in the house, like the monster or whatever it is, like maybe pretending that it's the father. That was the impression that I got. Um, so the father like essentially like asked her to look under the bed and it's dark in the room and you know it, it's just kind of like you, you remember like back when you were a little kid and you just like you thought you heard something in the room and it's like you want to look under the bed you know and you're thinking about that scene from poltergeist where the kid like looks under the bed that he comes out there's that like, evil clown doll and all that kind of shit so it's that kind of shit so i mean the next couple minutes after that it's just this exquisite exercise in dread and it, it comes from nothing really like other than our own deeply rooted fears from childhood and just this suggestive darkness that's on the screen in front of us because you're just like sitting there on the edge of your seat going what the fuck is under that bed like what's going to pop out in your face because it's like you know you're in the perspective of like a little kid who's like you know leaning down and like looking under there and it's like completely black and it's like really really creepy you know what i mean i so i think like the genius of this movie I mean, provided that you're willing to jump on its particular wave and, you know, kind of get into what it's trying to do, is that a lot of the scariness of the film comes from 
you doing a number on yourself, like your own imagination, because you're just the whole movie. It's so dark and, uh, you know, and, and it's just so unclear and just so inscrutable that every single scene, every single shot, you know, it's just like a lingering hallway or a lingering room and like these dark corners. And so your brain is just kind of like feverishly like searching this ever shifting, you know, very grainy blackness for these terrible things that you probably know are in there somewhere, you know what I mean? So it's really your imagination, like doing a number on yourself. And, and you really like this whole movie, I kind of, it really makes you feel like this is it's just some weird shit that you stumbled across, like on an old unmarked videotape in someone's attic or some shit like that. Like something you're not really supposed to be watching, like something that shouldn't have been recorded to start with. Like where the fuck did this come from? Like some from another dimension or something. Like that's not to say that it's particularly graphic or gory or I don't want to say it's not disturbing because the implications of it are disturbing, but it's not like real overt. Like it's not showing you a lot of violence or fucked up shit or anything like that. But the movie just feels like off or it feels like wrong somehow, like almost like it kind of like leached out of somebody's subconscious and like imprinted itself on tape, like that creepy shit from the ring, you know what I mean? Except like feature length. So I, I will say there are some interesting interpretations like floating around on the internet of what exactly is going on in this movie or like what this movie means, like if somebody want to explain it or something. Because I will say that despite the non-traditional narrative or the non-traditional way that it's presented, there is clearly something happening. There is clearly some kind of story going on behind it, some kind of symbolism, some kind of, you know what I mean? But it's just not holding your hand and telling you exactly what it is. And I think to a large extent, um, this movie will be a subjective experience for everyone. Like everyone's going to kind of interpret it um, maybe f it, through the lens of their own childhood, perhaps. I definitely personally got the impression that the children's mother, who you only see a couple of times, is perhaps divorcing the father. Um, I get the feeling that she was perhaps probably abusive. And I kind of also got the feeling that she might be the actual catalyst for whatever the supernatural monster or demon or whatever it is that's in the house that's like trapped them inside, like trapped them in this time loop essentially, which, you know, is apparently endless. Like it's, it's almost kind of like this purgatorial loop, like they're trapped inside because there's, uh, you know, images of like a dollhouse and things like that. So it's almost kind of like these kids are trapped in this endless loop of, you know, abuse or violence or something like that. Whether or not the, the demon is real, I kind of, my interpretation of it was that the mother was the was the monster, I guess. You know what I mean? Or or had invited the monster there somehow. Like I you know, but you know, there's other interpretations, but that's kind of like what I got from it. Um it actually seems significant that Kyle Edward Ball, the director, I saw like an interview with him, like where he was talking about Skinnamarink, and he mentioned Hansel and Gretel. Uh, which seemed, you know, that seemed very significant. He also said that the film was partially autobiographical. Like he was trying to convey a particular feeling that he and his sister had, because he has uh, a little bit older sister as well, uh, that they had when they were children dealing what, with whatever was happening in their own house and with their own parents. And like I said, so it, it's also significant that he shot this in the house that he and his sister grew up in. So he's definitely trying to take his own experiences of him and his sister being little kids and being scared in their dark house or thinking they're alone or something like that. And he's trying to put that on film and see if other people like kind of resonate with the same feeling that I got. And like I said, I think that he's largely been successful in doing that because watching this movie, I really got I remembered what that was like, like when you were a little kid and like you wake up in the middle of the night and it's like pitch black and you think nobody's in there. Or you think you see something in the corner. This is very, very good at conveying that very, very specific feeling. So as I mentioned, um, you know, this is absolutely not a film for everyone, but it really does seem like it's resonating hard, like with a large chunk of the horror movie fandom who, again, like understand the sensations that it's trying to convey, like the nostalgia, the like little bit of a nostalgic feeling, that childhood trauma that this movie is attempting to replicate. Now, when I first started watching this, I wasn't actually sure if I was going to enjoy it once I kind of like saw what it was doing. Um, I'm actually not proud of this and I don't usually do this, but 
when I first put it on, I was actually watching it on my laptop, like over here, like on one eye. And then I had my other computer like in front of me like that. And I was like working on something else. So I kept like glancing over watching it. After about 10 or 15 minutes though, like I just got hypnotized kind of like by the movie. So I just abandoned whatever work I was doing over here and then just like laser focused right on the movie. And it really kind of weaves this very creepy like bizarre spell over you if you let it do that and like i said if it doesn't resonate with you that's uh, you know that's obviously legitimate too because not everybody's you know horror is very subjective and some people are really going to get it and some people are just kind of like i don't get it or i get what they were going for but i don't think they were successful you know what i mean so i'm not saying that everybody has to like this and if you don't then you didn't get it or whatever but you know it's it's going to be a specific kind of person that really gets into it and i really really got into it it to me it seemed very mesmerizing and i immediately like remembered feeling the way he was trying to make me feel, you know what I mean? So yeah, I mean, whether you love it or hate it, I mean, you really can't deny that this movie is doing something wildly different and it's trying a new approach. And, you know, I think that's why I will always love horror. It's like forever innovating. It's all, you know, it's a certain portion of it is always, yeah, because there's always going to be knockoffs and things like that. But I kind of feel like, you know, out in the fringes of horror, there's always going to pe be people that are always innovating, looking for new ways to scare people, like to, looking for new ways to get past the, like the chinks in people's armor, like to really get them where they live. So like I said, if Skin and didn't particularly work for you, I mean, maybe something else will, but I definitely think in general, it's good to support independent and especially really experimental horror like this, because I think it's the best way to keep horror you know, to keep the genre really fresh and keep it scary. And like I said, even if you didn't like this particular movie, you know, maybe the next person that comes along, the next independent person that gets a chance because this one did well, you know, maybe that one will resonate with you like more than this one did. So I think it's good to like support this kind of stuff, even if you didn't particularly resonate with it. But I really liked this one a lot. Um, and it really made me feel a way that I haven't felt in a long time, you know what I mean? Which that's really a pretty awesome experience in itself. So, so that will do it for this flickers of here. Hope you enjoyed it. Remember to like, share, and comment if you enjoyed the video and I'll see you guys again on the next one. Bye.